Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are going to cover once again Romans chapter 8 verses 18 through 25. There's a lot that Paul covers here and it's really a summarization, if you will, a summary the, of the first seven chapters and at least the first 17 verses of chapter 8. And there's so much there that it will serve us well to reread these verses and and go a little deeper within them. Before we go into them, however, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Your word is life, and as we continue to draw our attention to it, you reveal a deeper and more profound level of your truth, a truth that we build confidence in, a truth that we build our lives on, a of truth that prevents us from succumbing to fear or worry or anxiety or jealousy, a fear or a wor your, uh, your word rather that grounds us in a truth that, well, in your words, cannot overcome your truth. And so as we go into your word today, please open our hearts and minds to experience your grace, your strength, your love, your hope, and your very presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting with verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. I'm going to stop there before we go on and just talk about this. When you look at Scripture, especially in the Gospel of Luke, Adam is considered God's son. Humanity is considered God's children. But in Genesis 3, we see that humanity went a different route, rejected sons, sonship, if you will, and attached ourselves to a being, a created being, a spiritual in nature, but spoke through the serpent, that led us into a false belief, a belief that was based on rebellion, a belief that was based on a deceit that God could not be trusted and that we needed to take matters into our own hands and that we needed to reject our creator and follow instead for our own benefit this other created creature, speaking through the serpent, but spiritual in nature. And as such, the sonship that we were intended and created to have and to live from was not only rejected on our part, but God, not forcing his will, removed that sonship relationship from us and actually allowed humanity to pursue other spiritual beings and to listen to other spiritual beings and put them in, in, in a position where we would learn from them and worship them, seek our well-being from them, seek wisdom from them. We see this happen um, in the Tower of Babel, for example, where God confuses their language and then allows them to go and worship other gods, other beings that were in this world. And so the Egyptians have their gods, and the Mesopotamians have their gods, and the Greeks have their gods, and the Asian different Asian peoples have their gods, and every, every clan of humanity had their own gods that were not gods at all. And God lost the relationship of sonship, and humanity lost that relationship of being God's children. But God was not done. God's plan would not be thwarted, and so he moved, starting with Abraham, where God had no, no, God no longer, because of that rejection of him, no longer had any kind of territory in which he reigned. It was all given over. So he started with the human being, with Adam, and from, I'm sorry, from Abraham. And from Abraham, he, through his descendants, formed a nation that would be his portion. So Abraham's descendants 
are now God's portion. Not territory yet, but a nation. And then, of course, God brought that nation into a certain territory. To, like God started in Genesis 2, be the Eden from which his name and his sovereignty and his presence would spread all throughout the world. And Israel then became God's son. Scripture, the Old Testament, refers to Israel as, you are my son. However, Israel rejected that relationship with God as well. And so God, through Israel, through the promises given to Abraham and through the history of Israel, promised to bring in again his son. And through Jesus, he did just that. He brought his son into the world. His son who, throughout his entire life, did not reject his father, did not reject the goodness or believe for a moment that God was not good, that God could not be trusted, that he had to take matters into his own hands, that in order for Jesus to live a full and meaningful and purposeful life, that he had to somehow look outside of God's will for that experience. No, he was obedient in joy, by the way. Jesus even tells his, his disciples, um, my, my joy I give to you. And he talks about discipleship and says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I tell you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And so what he's saying is that he discovered, not discovered, but lived in that truth, that in obedience to God's will is ultimate joy. As the scriptures say, for the joy set before him, he even endured the cross. And as such, he enacted the redemptive plan of God to recreate the world and to fix, if you will, what was ruined in Genesis 3. So he, being God's son, was able to do what Adam, being God's first son, was unable to do, and what Israel, being God's son collectively, was unable to do. And now through faith in him, through the mere realization that there's something here that's true, you may have doubt. We will all have doubt. Faith does not mean the absence of doubt. Faith means that it be this, this realization of what God is doing is true, and that truth then begins to grow in our realization and as such drive out doubt or remove doubt. But that's a process. It's a lifelong process because the doubt that we have goes so deep, it goes layer upon layer upon layer. But in faith in Christ purposely placing ourselves to seek his kingdom and learning from him and continuously turning our trust over to him, we are grafted in and adopted as sons. Just as originally Adam was, Israel was claimed to be, and now we are. We are God's sons, and as such, we will reign with God. And this is why Paul writes, for the cre and this is verse 19, for the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. All of creation. Because once God's sons are revealed, that means that the accumulation of the ages has come to fulfillment and the consummation of the new creation is now the reality. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. I pray that uh, this this uh, devotion was meaningful to you, and I look forward to spending more time with you next time. 
Until then, may the peace of God be with you. I'll see you there.